Alrighty, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you tuned in to the fifth installment of our Green Construction Webinar Series, and today we're going to be covering the very impactful topic of how to reduce embodied carbon in concrete. Now, we've covered this topic at a high level in previous webinars, but we're really honing in on concrete today because it is without a doubt the most high impact building material we work with on a day to day basis. It's responsible for over 8% of global carbon emissions. If it were its own country, it would be the third largest CO2 emitter behind China and the United States. So these are huge scales of impact that we're talking about, and we as builders finally have the ability to do something about it. So today, we have three fantastic guests who are going to be speaking about that very topic. Dirk Kessner is our first speaker who will talk about the scale of the issue and how you can engage your structural engineer on how to reduce carbon in concrete. He's the Director of Sustainable Design at Walter P. Moore in Austin and works with all of their offices across North America. He's a board member of the Carbon Leadership Forum and was previously chair of the USGBC Materials and Resources Technical Advisory Group. Our second speaker is Alana Gazetta, the manager of U.S. Concrete's National Research Lab in San Jose and has been with U.S. Concrete for the past 10 years. Her team is responsible for evaluating new materials, developing mixed designs with targeted performance, trial batching, and developing baseline data. She also collaborates with architects and engineers on a regular basis to figure out ways to meet project goals with concrete. And our third and final speaker is our very own Dave Maynard, SPO Concrete Manager based out of our Seattle office. David has been in the industry for 15 years and for the entirety of his role at Turner, he's been doing self-performed scopes, especially concrete. David has been involved on projects from transit tunnels to high-rise buildings to tiny slab infills and everything in between, and is a key member of Turner's Embodied Carbon Steering Committee. So, Dirk, if you want to go to the next slide, we've got sure. some really awesome speakers with us today, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. So let's get through some housekeeping items before we start our presentation. So as usual, please remember to keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop it in the chat. Our speakers are going to try and get through and hit as many of those as they can throughout the presentation. And finally, if you are looking to snag some of those CE hours for me, you can go ahead and find those instructions up on the screen right there. Feel free to take a screenshot or the instructions can also be found online on the TPM Sustainability website where today's recording as well as previous presentations can be found. Um, so without further ado, Dirk, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. So thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Dirk Kessner. I'm uh, a structural trained as a civil and structural engineer and was a project manager for many years. But um, as Emmy mentioned, I am now our corporate director of sustainable design. So a big piece of what I'm working on is embodied carbon. And it's exciting because I get to work with all of our offices across our practice. For those of you who may not know Walter P. Moore, we are a uh, civil structural enclosure and forensic engineering firm with offices mostly across the southern half of the U.S., but we work across the country and across the world. And we have a few international offices working on um, projects from as large as SoFi Stadium, one that we designed, and I know that you, you were able to be part of the build and the JV there, so that I think we're all very proud of that, to smaller um, you know, hospitals, academic buildings, some funky CLT things, and some net zero projects as well. So as we get going, um, you know, first we really need to start off with what is embodied carbon? So we have a level set and we all are on the same page. And this graphic that um, was created for uh, the EC3 tool that uh, really shows it pretty succinctly. Um, over on the right is operational carbon. And what most people have been, you know, uh, historically thinking about as far as carbon emissions of buildings, the carbon emissions from the energy that's consumed to keep the lights on and to keep them warm or cold. But in the past decade, and more recently, really in the past couple of years, the focus on embodied carbon and the urgency of addressing embodied carbon, because it happens upfront when we're building, um, has uh, gained, I would say, uh, finally gained the attention it has long deserved. And embodied carbon is what it takes to make the stuff in the simple way. But looking at, for a material, and today we'll talk about concrete, what does it take to extract the aggregate, extract the sand, take the limestone that you're going to turn into cement, then process it, you know, ship it from all the different quarries, 
to the batch plant, get it into the back of the drum, mixed in the truck, delivered, installed, and maintained, and even uh, what happens to it at the end of life. So it's all of the other carbon, if you will, associated with um, making them, making, installing, and maintaining the materials. And um, one of the things that, that people have first asked was, well, why does it matter? And uh, as was mentioned, you know, the concrete and cement emissions are a huge portion of man-made CO2 emissions in the, the world. Um, historically, people have thought about the built environment emissions as just one chunk of emissions. But this chart on the left kind of breaks it down with a bit more granularity, showing that there are building operations and then um, what people might think of industry, but that there's the concrete, steel, and aluminum that's being made. An awful lot of that is going into our buildings. So as people who either specify, uh, make, or build with concrete, steel, and aluminum, it's really important that we're aware that about 22%, so more than a fifth, less than a quarter, is coming from those three materials. And what this means for the built environment is that for buildings built today, um, about half of their CO2 emissions um, in the next 30 years are going to come from the materials. And that's because there's this big upfront emission associated with the materials, but also because of all the other great things that are going on with buildings becoming more energy efficient and uh, electrified and the electrical grid decarbonizing. So if we're looking at a 30 year horizon of where the carbon is for a building that we're working on right now, about half of it's in the materials and the other half is in the, uh, the operations in a general way. And then we can also look at, um, you know, other data. This was from Fortune, but looking at um, kind of why we need to not think about our materials lumped into manufacturing, but specifically look at what they are. So the donut on the left, the red section is what might be just seen on the surface as manufacturing emissions, but the, uh, the right shows where it is. And it again shows that a large portion of those manufacturing emissions are from cement, iron, and steel. And then also, you know, chemicals and oil and gas, that goes into some of the polymers and plastics and other stuff that's attributed that goes into our buildings. But today we're here to talk about concrete. And the reason we're talking about concrete, um, I think there's, there's two reasons, three, probably even more, I shouldn't try to number them, but we use a lot of it. It's present in every building. It's present in buildings in different ways. And because it's a, a kind of a mix by mix recipe, it's delivered to the, the job site hundreds, if not thousands of times uh, in different trucks. And I mentioned it's present in all buildings. And this is a, a carbon study that we did for uh, a project where we were comparing a mass timber building, option one, to a concrete building, option two. And these are paired impact comparisons for, for different uh, environmental impacts. The left pair is global warming or embodied carbon. And what I want you to see from this is that the yellow, that deep yellow is concrete. So yes, in the quote, concrete building, the concrete's responsible for about half the embodied carbon. But the thing about it is for the mass timber building, the concrete is about half of the embodied carbon for that one. So it's not just a, conc a concrete building issue. It's something that we need to think about when we build. And the easiest way to start to get our heads around this is to step back and think about the concrete cylinders that um, perhaps you've, you've taken sometime in your career or you've seen taken or that are uh, taken um, daily uh, for projects that we use to check uh, the compressive strength of concrete. So, the cylinder looks like that in its real form, but we could kind of cut it through the long axis and look at what's in the concrete. And if we cut it through that, that long axis and looked at it, what we'd see are you know, the rocks, big rocks, small rocks, and then the, the paste that's all kind of inner, uh, filling in the space around that. And if we thought about it by the weight of, where, uh, of what's made up of that concrete, um, a large portion of it is in the coarse aggregate, kind of working from, from left over to right, and a big piece is in the sand. And then a smaller portion of the weight is in the cement that I'm showing by this gray powder on the top, or some of the uh, other cement, cementitious materials, flash, slag, these other materials that are used in concrete kind of alternate cements, and the water. But we're not so concerned about where the weight is of a building. We're concerned about where the embodied carbon is, 
So if we look at that by embodied carbon, we see that the vast majority of that concrete is due to the cement. And the reason for that is that cement is a material that's made from limestone. What we do to make uh, reinforced concrete in specifically the Portland cement and reinforced concrete is we take stone, we grind it and heat it up at the really high temperatures so that then we can get the clinker, which is shown as the CAO on the right side of this equation. And then we mix that with some gypsum and some water, we stick some rebar in it, and then we make stone in the shape that we want with rebar within it. But this process of taking limestone, which is CaCO3 on the left, adding heat, which emits CO2 just from the kiln energy, getting it to thousands of degrees, to produce the CaO, just from the chemistry of it, you break out CO2. If you want to get CaO, which is the clinker, out of CaCO3, you're left with CO2. And that's why kind of as a real rough rule of thumb, every pound of cement emits a pound of CO2. The num actual numbers are a, a bit lower, but for rough rules of thumb, you can think of a pound for pound. So when you're looking at mixed designs or when you're thinking about this, you know, every pound of uh, cement is about a pound of CO2. And that's why it's only 10 to 12% of the weight, but the vast majority of the concrete, uh, of the CO2 for the concrete. And I think it's important, um, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but cement and concrete are not the same thing. Concrete's what comes out of the back of the truck, cement is, is a component of it. The other piece, and a lot of people say, oh, we'll put fly ash, and fly ash isn't uh, a byproduct from burning coal that has cementitious properties, we'll put fly ash in it, and we'll have a high percent. But it's not about putting fly ash in the mix and using that material. It's about how much cement you're using or ultimately the embodied carbon of the mix. So uh, just to dispel that, you know, don't think about adding fly ash. Um, and we, we track our mixes as they come in in our submittals. And then we look at the embodied carbon of the different mixes to try to understand why we're getting a mix with, you know, a certain embodied carbon in one instance and another. And then we'll talk to our teams about that. So um, this shows 400 of our mixes um, with global warming potential or embodied carbon on the y-axis and the percent SCM on the x. And you see there's a whole lot of scatter. But when we go back to um, plotting GWP, still embodied carbon on the y, and cement content, just cement in pounds per cubic yard of the mix, uh, we see that there's a much better correlation. It's kind of a pretty straight line. So with that, uh, you know, we like to work with the teams to use to make sure that our specification and our procedures permit the optimum use of cementitious materials in the mix. And to kind of think about how that all gets influenced and what really happens in a project, we can start to take kind of uh, a view of the different parties involved in designing something, getting it built, and how that gets conveyed across uh, through the chain. And um, Maybe what's not so great about the traditional way that it can happen, because I've got an alternate on the next slide, but we as a structural engineer will produce drawings, we'll write specs, and we're mostly um, concerned with the strength and the, the final or initial conditions and uh, durability requirements. That gets handed off to the architect who might add some aesthetic requirements. It goes through the owner and comes to the general contractor who in our experience, you know, is really focused on schedule, the schedule requirements and being able to uh, get it built. Uh, the concrete subcontractor then will think about um, things like pumpability, workability, finishability. Some of this mixes together with the GC and the, the sub and sometimes they're one and the same. But all that gets handed back to the ready mix supplier who has to figure out how to meet all those requirements plus deal with their uh, material availability and logistics challenges. And these kind of arrows that I'm showing going up and back across this invisible wall can get really cumbersome. So, so the better way that we found it uh, to work is when we can uh, have the owner break down this wall, when we can be collaborative and when we can have discussions, I show them circularly, but there's actually a whole lot more lines there, understanding who really needs what out of the, the concrete when, and um, if any of these requirements that we think we need are uh, conflicting. And to kind of just illustrate this, that you know, concrete is a living material, it gains strength over time. This is kind of your classic strength development curve with the scatter that occurs and then kind of the, the mean strength. But that 
that curve, I showed the red line at first, really depending on the mix proportions, you, you can bend this curve different ways and it's going to uh, what, um, you know, have implications in different ways. So as a structural engineer, we're primarily concerned with stuff out at the right end, even beyond 90 days, that strength in the final condition, when the 40 stories are built on that pier or footing and when the, the earthquake or windstorm happens. And then also we do impose strength requirements early on for things like post-tensioning or, or form removal. But the, uh, the builder, your, your concerns many times I've seen are at the like very, very early on, 12, 24, 48, 72 hours, because you wanna keep the project going. And then sometimes if we're not all talking, that just becomes some arbitrary percentage, maybe a percentage that has been used, of the 28 day strength that is the metric that we've historically used. But there's not really nothing magical about 28 days. We need to have these discussions to understand who needs what out of the mix one. And um, to quantify the embodied carbon, uh, the way that's done, and I know uh, others will talk about that, is through an environmental product declaration or an EPD. That's like a nutrient label for concrete, except it's showing things like embodied carbon and other impacts. And when we have those EPDs, what we can do, and this is a project where we took the impact numbers after it was built and kind of plotted them back onto a Revit model, we see that there's a lot of different concretes on a project and those concretes have different embodied carbons as we look at kind of the heat map of this from green being the lowest through the yellows to the reds. And this project, we were really working on managing embodied carbon. So those upper floors you see some are half red and some are orange. That's where we were actually using different mixes based on the, the temperature, the daily forecast. Um, so those are some intro pieces about how structural engineers are thinking about embodied carbon. One of the big things that structural engineers are doing, there's a lot of things in the industry right now, but there's a new initiative, SE 2050, for structural engineers to measure and educate and uh, benchmark on embodied carbon. And as of this morning, there are 40 firms of various sizes and various practice concentrations across the country who have committed. But now I will hand it off to Alana. Well, thank you, Dirk. Uh, all right, I'll get my presentation on. Uh, so, as it was mentioned in, uh, in my introduction, uh, I work for U.S. Concrete, um, so I've come from the ready-mix supplier perspective, and so as a ready-mix supplier, our responsibility is to come up with concrete mix designs that, that meet performance and provide data for that and then deliver that to the job site. Um, and so my role with U.S. Concrete uh, is managing our research lab. And U.S. Concrete is made up of a variety of ready mix companies in different parts of the country. Um, we're headquartered out of Texas, and we have ready mix operations in the Dallas, Fort Worth area, also getting into Oklahoma. Um, we also have ready mix operations in New York, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., and uh, Philadelphia, and then also in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and San Francisco Bay Area and the Virgin Islands. And then we also do have um, some of our own aggregate sources in the Texas area, in the New Jersey area, and then also the, the dot that you see on the map up at, in uh, British Columbia, um, Van, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, is um, an aggregate quarry called Orca um, that we, is an aggregate material that we use in the San Francisco Bay Area and, and then also supply into the Los Angeles market. And so each of our different ready mix companies have their own quality assurance team that manages their mix catalog and their day-to-day -day projects. And then U.S. Concrete as a whole has one team that is focused on the research side. And so that's what my team does. And our lab facility is actually in San Jose, California. So we're in the West region um, for U.S. Concrete, but we collaborate with the um, ready mix companies or with our business units across the country. Um, a lot of times my team is one of the first to take a look at new products or new materials that we're going to try to use in concrete, trying to do very specialized performance, and then being able to kind of do an in-depth study and provide that data to our quality assurance teams to help them with implementing new technologies. <laughs> 
So I want to start out with specifications as, as kind of a jumping off point from where Dirk talked about from the structural engineering perspective. And just taking a look at this from our perspective as a ready mix producer, um, I think Dirk covered it really well in terms of how helpful communication can be and, uh, and in terms of what kind of impact the specs can have. And what we've done is actually put together a specification guide, and that's what's shown on the screen in the table. And it's really just intended to show you that this table exists, not for you to be able to read because it's it's tiny print on this screen. Um, but this is something that's available on Central Concrete's website, and that I'm also happy to provide a link to if this would be helpful. Um, and what it is, is we touch on three things that we tend to see in specifications that are prescriptive and can really limit what we can do in terms of going low embodied carbon. And those three things are having a minimum cement content, having a maximum water cement ratio. And that water cement ratio is just a number um, that corresponds to the water content in the mix divided by the powder in the mix. And that powder can be uh, just Portland cement or it could be a combination of Portland cement and cement replacement materials. And traditionally in a concrete mix, if you're changing nothing other than the water cement ratio, as you go lower in the water cement ratio, you go higher in strength of the concrete. Um, so having a maximum water cement ratio limit and then having a maximum uh, cement replacement content. And so what this table shows and what this guide shows is what we believe the intention usually is of those types of specifications or those limits. And then down below that is what the missed opportunities are from a um, embodied carbon perspective and trying to get reductions. And then below that are suggestions or considerations for doing more performance based spec or, you know, an alternative way to doing the specification that would still meet that intended performance, but not uh, limit the embodied carbon in these types of um, prescriptive manners. And then the other piece too, um, as Dirk talked about in terms of slump and placement, that's really something that the we need to have as a conversation with the contractor rather than needing to be specified from the structural engineer, because um, that's going to be dependent on whatever the placement methods are and the and the scheduling and all of that. And so we really just need to, from the specification, have what is the performance that needs to be met so we can figure out what's the right combination of materials. And then also, how do we do that right combination for whatever the contractor's needs are? Um, and then putting that all together in the lowest embodied carbon way possible. And in terms of looking specifically at that second, um, uh, that second, method um, in terms of water to cementitious ratio. This is just an example of showing what kind of impact that can have on the embodied carbon. And so what this shows is on the left hand side, you have four different mixes, the red bar being 100% cement mix. And then uh, to the right of that, you have a mix of 25% fly ash. Um, and then the gray bars are ternary mixes, which means we have a combination of Portland cement, slag, and fly ash and at different cement replacement levels at 50 and at 70. And so you can see that the GWP, which is that global warming potential value that comes from an environmental product declaration, that that decreases as the cement replacement increases. And uh, at a 0.45 water cement ratio, you can see what those values are. And then if you go over to the right hand side and look at those same mixes with a higher water to cementitious ratio of 0.50, that we have a 7 to 12 percent reduction in embodied carbon. And so if there is a limit placed to that water cementitious ratio where when it's a limit, it's usually a maximum um, that we're limiting how low we can go on the embodied carbon. And so in terms of, you know, what can we do in terms of lowering the embodied carbon of a concrete mix, there's a variety of different methods and kind of different levers that we can use in terms of mix design that will impact the embodied carbon of the concrete. And so I'm going to go through each of these, um, the first one being cement type, also using cement replacement materials, uh, our aggregate selection and how that can impact admixtures, sequester CO2, and then lastly talking through the use of waste products as well. So in terms of cement type, uh, our, the typical Portland cement 
material that gets that has been used is one that follows the ASTM C150 designation. And in most parts of the country, that's a type one or a type two under that designation. In California and in a couple other parts of the country, um, we actually use what's called a type five. And it's something that just has a, a better sulfate resistance. Um, but something that is a big conversation now is going more to a different type of cement, something that falls under the ASTM C595 designation. And the C595 is intended for different blends with Portland cement. So it may not be pure Portland cement. You could actually go ahead and blend it with something else. And so specifically, one of the types under that designation is a type 1L. And so we call it a Portland limestone cement, which means that the cement is actually blended with some limestone that hasn't gone through the kiln. If you recall from Dirk's presentation, the way cement is made is you take limestone and you put it into a kiln and you heat it up really high and that turns into your reactive cement product. And what you can actually do is take that reactive cement product at the end and blend it with some limestone that hasn't gone through the kiln so it doesn't have that high embodied carbon and blend that in with the cement up to a higher amount with the C595 than you can do with a C150. A C150 you can actually put up to 5% of that limestone in it but with a C595 you can put up to 15%. This is a pretty standard cement that's used up in the Pacific Northwest and in California, we're anticipating that in a year or so, that's probably gonna be a very standard cement that we use. Um, the holdup right now is that um, Caltrans needs to approve the use of it. As a ready mix producer, we don't have unlimited silo capacity and you've got to store your cement in a silo. And so most ready mix producers are gonna stick with a cement where they can do both Caltrans and non Caltrans work. Um, but once Caltrans approves the use of a C595 cement, I can see, you know, it's likely that a lot of producers would be uh, transitioning over to that and that would just be standard in the marketplace. What it's looking like is uh, uh, October of this year, they're likely to be approving that. So actionable considerations and things that we can do from a specification side or, or ask questions as a contractor side is to have the specifications allow both types of cements. Um, so that's going to allow whatever is in that market to be used um, and also the transition as uh, the type 1Ls get adopted more. So then the next item is cement replacement materials. These are going to be dependent on the um, what is available locally. Not all parts of the country have the same type of cement replacement materials. But what we're talking about when we're talking about these types of materials are things like slag or fly ash or natural pozzolan. Um, glass pozzolan is a newer one that's available out on the market. And so these are different powders that can be used in replacement of Portland cement that will provide some benefit, not only in terms of lowering the embodied carbon, but in uh, increasing the durability of the concrete, making denser concrete. These are types of materials that have been used for decades in concrete for reasons other than reducing the embodied carbon, just because they provide great benefit to the concrete. And so with these, um, these are just kind of a great thing to be using in terms of lowering embodied carbon because we've got history with them. Um, and they're gonna provide better performance to the concrete. There are also some things to consider in terms of architectural aesthetics and, and what you're seeing. And so I'll go through a couple of those as well. Um, actionable considerations here are to have specifications that allow the use of supplementary cementitious materials, um, not limiting them or not putting prescriptive um, quantities um, for them because that can really be, that can really be changed. Um, and a ready mix producer, it's best to have the flexibility to be able to do whatever combination is correct for the application. Because um, something to be aware of is the more that cement that you replace with these types of materials, you are going to have uh, some longer set times. And it does push out uh, that curve that Dirk showed in terms of strength gain. It does push out that curve to where it takes a little, it can take a little bit longer to uh, achieve the same strength. Um, we can still meet whatever 20 day strength is that an engineer requires, but we just have to proportion accordingly knowing uh, that rate of strength gain. 
And then the more performance-based the specification is, the better you can be utilizing these. And then also um, pushing out that F prime C, which is your design strength from the structural engineer. If that's able to go 28 to 56 days or even something later, that allows for better utilization of the basically higher cement replacement of these materials um, to do lower embodied carbon. But you wanna make sure you're doing that where it doesn't impact the schedule. And then in terms of what these do for embodied carbon, this is just an example of how that GWP value, the global warming potential value of mixed designs is reduced with uh, replacing the Portland cement. So the gray bar on the left hand side is 100% cement mix. And then that middle bar is a 50% cement replacement mix at, at the same uh, compressive strength at the same age, 6,000 PSI at 28. And we're getting a 45% reduction there. And then when we go with mixes that are 70% cement replacement at that same performance, that 6,000 PSI at 28 days, we're actually getting a 60% reduction in embodied carbon or that GWP value. And then in terms of the durability and the and kind of performance benefits that I mentioned, this is one particular example where we look at um, how the concrete gets dense more dense and what that how that's helpful in a situation with chlorides. So the, the bars, the vertical bars are rapid chloride permeability test results from my lab team, where uh, it's a test that measures the permeability of the concrete or how how porous is it. And so you can see the bars on the left hand side for the 100% cement mix, those have higher values than the ones to the right. The higher value you have in this test, the more porous the concrete is, which means that you've got more potential for things like chlorides or sulfates to get in through the concrete and get to the rebar, which is what you're trying to avoid. You want your concrete to be protecting the rebar. And so when we go to a 25% fly ash mix, those values are lower. And so that means that's a denser concrete, um, less permeable. And then we go to a 50% cement replacement ternary mix. Um, those values are even lower there. So you can see that we're making the concrete more dense. And then when we take a look at um, a program that's available to calculate for the design service life in terms of exposure to chlorides, and so those would be chlorides coming from the soil, particularly in a marine environment or something like that. We get some of our soils here in the, in the Bay Area have chlorides. Um, when we calculate the service life, that service life increases as we go more on the cement replacement and, uh, and lower in the permeability. So with this, the use of these materials that are lowering the embodied carbon, we're actually getting longer service life, um, specifically here shown in chloride environments. And so then in terms of color and things to consider um, on the architectural side, slag is a white material. So that can lighten the gray of the concrete color, which is sometimes a, um, an aesthetic that's desired. Something to be aware of is that the color of your aggregate can really make a difference in that. So the upper right hand part of the screen shows um, actually a white, a white cement mix that's got 50% slag and a white aggregate. And then you compare that on the right hand side to the same type of cementitious blend, but a darker aggregate. And that does change the, the appearance of it. Um, so those are all just things to be aware of. And then in terms of kind of the different variety of grays that you can be getting, um, there's your fly ash is gonna be anywhere from a dark gray to kind of a tan color. And so that can change the, the color that the paste appears. Um, again, the slag is white. And so that can give a lighter, lighter gray or even a good base for integral colors. With that lighter kind of brighter base, it actually can help with um, integral color as well. Something to also be aware of with slag is that it tends to, um, if you have, when you strip the forms, um, it can have kind of a greenish color on the outside of the concrete, which goes away with time as it gets exposed to sunlight and the air and oxidation um, reaction occurs and that goes away. But that's something you wanna be aware of and set up expectations because you don't want an architect to come shortly after the, the forms are stripped and to be surprised by, uh, by that color. So those are all kind of things you wanna talk through with a ready mix supplier and, and have an understanding of and, and make sure to get consistency with. And so then going on to aggregate, as Dirk mentioned, while cement is the majority of the embodied carbon in the mix, 
uh, aggregate actually takes up the largest amount of volume in a mix. And so your coarse aggregate and your fine aggregate or your rock and your sand is going to take up anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of the volume of a concrete mix. So that has a significant contribution to the performance of the concrete and can also uh, impact the embodied carbon as well. So with that, um, when we have high quality or high performing aggregates, and for example, um, one in particular is our aggregate out of British Columbia um, called Orca, that we're actually able to do lower embodied carbon mixes because we can lower the cement content. And with this type of aggregate, we can also have conversations with structural engineers to show what we're able to do in making the concrete more stiff, in having lower deflection, in having the high strength and low shrinkage, for them to then consider are there design efficiencies that you can do knowing that you know we can get concrete that's above average performance um, and potentially limit the amount of volume of material that you're using in a design. And so again, having a performance specification is going to be helpful in a ready mix producer being able to suggest these types of things. In terms of embodied carbon with aggregate, this is a, just a demonstration of what I'm talking about in terms of being able to lower the cement content. The, um, what you see on this here is these are a plot of strengths and there's just three different types of mix designs represented on the X axis at the bottom. And the red bars are all mixes that utilize ORCA aggregate, whereas the black bars are all mixes that uh, utilize just a standard uh, kind of gravel aggregate that's locally available. And what we'll look at as ready mix producers is look at the efficiency of the mix in terms of PSI per pound. And so what that means is we're taking what the total cementitious content is in the mix in pounds per cubic yard, divide that by the strength or and, and take the strength that you're getting, divide it by that, um, that cementitious content. And so you can see the Orca mixes are all getting a higher PSI per pound than the standard gravel mixes. We're above 10 PSI per pound with the Orca mixes. And so what that means is we need less of that powder or less cementitious content to achieve the same strength. And that again will lower the embodiment of your mix as well. Going back to what Dirk showed on that linear plot of where cement content is really related to the embodied carbon of the mix. And then additionally, things that we can be considered on an admixture level are something that can really be considered from a contractor perspective. So there are newer admixtures out there that make concrete more flowable with a lower paste content. And so this can be helpful in lowering the embodied carbon as well. Traditionally, if you're trying to do something like an SCC mix or something, a um, self-consolidating mix, or something that's close to that and is very flowable, we have to do a high powder content, have a high paste content in order to make it flowable like that. And having to put more of that cementitious material means you're increasing the embodied carbon of the mix. And so something that we can be looking at as well is actually using these new admixtures to pull down that cementitious content, but still get that same flow ability and help in the efficiency of concrete placement um, while using lower embodied carbon concrete. Additionally, there are things that we can be considering in terms of um, fibers that can replace steel. Synthetic fibers can be used for replacing either welded wire fabric or number three and number four temperature and shrinkage reinforcement. Um, and so these are things that you could look at in terms of weighing the options of putting in synthetic fibers in a concrete mix and not having your rebar versus having that rebar and having that additional transfer transportation to the site if you're looking at the project as a whole in terms of um, kind of a, a whole building LCA or something like that. And in terms of those fibers specifically, just to show a little bit of what they look like and what they do, the ones on the left hand side are a, a small, very thin fiber that's used for to help prevent very early age cracking. That would be something that a contractor would choose to use if, uh, you know, cracking is an important consideration, or if you're pouring in a, a hot, um, windy environment where you're more prone to have issues at that top surface on the day that you're setting. But then there are other ones, like the ones on the right-hand side, which are fibrillated, which can be used to replace the welded wire fabric. Or there's a hybrid system that we have available that is a combination of those small monofilament fibers on the left and a longer um, sort of tape-like 
fi fiber that uh, will lay flat to have good finishing, but that larger size allows it to replace either welded wire fabric or number three, number four temperature reinforcement. And so that's something that we can help analyze from our perspective, along with the structural engineer to look at, you know, the potential for being able to do that. The other thing that you can consider with fibers as well is extending uh, the joint spacing. So then kind of the latest and newest ingredient that we can be using in concrete is sequestered CO2. And right now the technology that's available on the market is where it's injected into ready mix concrete. And so this is through a technology right now called carbon cure where um, the CO2 from an emitter is stored at a concrete plant um, in a liquid form and then gets injected into the concrete along with all the other ingredients, the cement, the aggregate, the water, um, all of that together. And what happens is when it goes into the concrete, it turns into calcium carbonate or very fine limestone pieces, which can help give uh, a performance boost as well. And so with this, what you're doing is kind of two things. One, you're putting in recycled CO2 into the concrete. So instead of being emitted, it's being trapped in the concrete and will stay there. Um, and then also you can get a performance boost with that. So you either get a little bit higher strength early on or the ready mix producer can even reduce the amount of cement that's in the mix with by using that, uh, that strength increase to be able to do that. So it can also, if you are able to pull some of the cement out that will lower the GWP of the mix. And then also on the, on the research, side I am involved in um, there are other tech a lot of other technologies that are um, that are being built up that are putting a higher amount of co2 um, either through the aggregate or through the powder um, and so I think we have a lot of exciting things coming up in the future as well in terms of being able to sequester a lot more co2 into concrete and so then lastly, um, we've talked about reducing the embodied carbon of concrete. Also utilizing waste products may not show up as a GWP reduction in the mix, but is an important piece to this as well. Um, on average, I think the industry gets back about 5% of the concrete that goes out the door. And that could be for, you know, either over ordering or whatever reasons, um, we end up having, you know, concrete that's not being used returned back to us. And so being able to utilize that is important um, for kind of getting that full, uh, full cycle. So we've got some municipalities will actually require the use of recycled concrete aggregate. And so recycled concrete aggregate is one way to use that return concrete, where you take that return concrete, you dump it out on the ground, and then you can take it and crush it into aggregate, which is the photo down at the bottom. And what you can see is that that aggregate is going to come with a variety of properties. You've got the pieces on the left hand side that are going to have a lot of mortar bonded to the sand and to some of the coarse aggregate pieces. And then like over on the right hand side, you'll have some of those coarse aggregate pieces that actually get separated and pop out and are just pretty much the same as what they were um, when they went into the concrete originally. And so with that, just understanding the quality and where that, uh, the quality of that recycled concrete aggregate is important for a ready mix producer to be able to use it well. Um, but you can still get very good mixes uh, with the use of recycled concrete aggregate, replacing, partially replacing some of your aggregate in the mix. And so this is just kind of wrapping up all of those different technologies. I talked through a variety of ways that the mix design can be changed um, in terms of lowering the embodied carbon. These are just kind of showing where some of those ideal applications are based on common um, applications in a project. It's not to say that you can't use any of these technology everywhere for all applications, but some of them are a little more ideal or a little easier to implement um, in some than in others. For example, doing a higher cement replacement on something that you're not going to be finishing, something like a column or a wall or a foundation is ideal so that you're not dealing with a longer set time. Whereas something that's flat work that will require some finishing, you're going to want to probably not go as high on the cement replacement there. And then lastly, the implementation kind of from a ready mix perspective, but also the contractor perspective, 
We now have systems on our trucks that measure and manage the slump. And so this is providing transparency to the design team to see what went on with the water for this mix. And then also um, allows us to help deliver uh, a lot more consistent concrete, um, which is helpful, helpful you know, from a placing perspective. And then also the use of maturity sensors to get that in-place constructability or that in-place strength for that early age constructability is really helpful for mixes with cement replacement materials. Since sometimes with those, you can really have a bigger difference between what's actually happening in place versus what's happening in the concrete cylinders. And so this allows you to capture that in real time um, and be able to use low embodied carbon, but stay on schedule. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Dave. Awesome. Thanks, Alana. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about uh, self-performed concrete um, and let's talk about how uh, embodied carbon uh, affects that and what we're doing. Uh, my name is Dave Maynard. I'm a self-performed project manager out of Seattle, and uh, I've had a hand in concrete projects, both big and small, around the area. Um, as you guys know, Turner pioneered the use of <clears throat> steel reinforced concrete like 115 years ago, and that was also self-performed, mind you. So I think it's only fitting that our self-performed group leads the charge on reducing embodied carbon on our projects. And I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, what is it that we've done here to reduce embodied carbon? So we're going to look at two projects here in Seattle, uh, the Dexter Yard and the Seattle Aquarium. Um, and this will give you two examples of how we've reduced embodied carbon. So the first example is 700 Dexter which is a large multi-use building in South Lake Union in downtown Seattle. Uh, the space includes parking, amenity, and lab uh, and office spaces, so true mixed-use building. This project's one of the largest self-performed concrete projects in the recent, recent history of Seattle. Uh, it's got over 40,000 yards of concrete, and we placed it all in a little over a year. Uh, the decks are all PD, so early strength's important. And here's a rendering of the project that takes up an entire city block downtown. This is a picture uh, of about a month ago, and thankfully it looks very similar to that rendering, which means we must be doing something correctly. So this project didn't actually have any specific embodied carbon reduction goals, um, but it, we did utilize a lot of replacement cementitious mix designs. Uh, we worked with the design team early on uh, to understand the requirements for ultimate strengths and push out the overall strength gain, strength gain requirements to longer than 28 days where we could, like the foundations, for example. And in doing this, we could ease the burden of early strength gain and how much cement we needed in the mixes. In addition to this, we utilized maturity sensors in the concrete to measure in-place strength as opposed to only using field cure cylinders, which can be hit or miss as it relates to the actual in-place strength of the concrete. We'll talk about those a little bit later. After the fact, we actually studied the overall reductions in embodied carbon uh, by comparing against the uh, NRMCA baselines. Uh, NRMCA is the National Ready Mix Concrete Association and they produce a baseline of embodied carbon uh, for mixed designs by geographical region, and it's based on the strength. So 1, 000, you know, 2,000 PSI mixes, 3,000 PSI mixes, 4,000 PSI mixes, et cetera. Essentially, they average the embodied carbon across multiple plants in your region for each strength class of that mix and provide that baseline of, of what the average carbon is. So we created this table right here, and it may seem a little bit overwhelming, um, but it's actually very simple. It's a measurement of the embodied carbon of the chosen mix designs versus the regional baselines that I just talked about from NRMCA. And so what's circled here in red are the actual mix designs that we use, the total cubic yards on the project and the design strength. The item in yellow is the actual uh, GWP of the mix design, which we got from the EPD of each mix that we used. The rest of the information in this table is uh, the baseline uh, info from NRMCA and calculations. So essentially, the only things that we really put in here are the items in red and the item in yellow. Uh, really not a difficult process, took us about 15 minutes. Um, what we found is that by utilizing our preferred mix designs, again, we didn't have an eye for embodied carbon reduction on this project necessarily, we were able to reduce the uh, embodied carbon of our concrete by 39% against the uh, baseline of NRMCA, which is a big deal. Um, these mixes had zero impact on the project schedule. Uh, like Alana mentioned, uh, we, used, we were strategic in our selection of mixes. So we did more cement replacement in vertical elements in the foundations, uh, less cement replacement in like the PT decks where we need early strength. But we were also able to offset that by using uh, maturity sensors and measuring that in-place strength. So 
it's important to note that we did all this embodied carbon reduction and we had no impact to our typical schedule, um, which is a lot to say. So safe to say we were very pleased with these results. Then we look at the uh, Seattle Aquarium, right? And uh, this is a new project that we're doing in downtown Seattle. It's currently under construction and it's an expansion to the existing aquarium facilities on the pier, which is in the corner of this picture here. Brand new building, brand new exhibit. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, the owner is very keen on conservation and sustainable construction. Uh, they provided Turner with and the design team with a goal to hit 30% embodied carbon reduction in the overall construction of the building, in addition to LEED certification. So we worked with the design team early on in the SD and the DD phases uh, to make sure that we could optimize the design to hit the goal. Here's some more renderings. As you can see, it's going to be quite the spec uh, spectacular building uh, and uh, quite an experience for the visitors uh, with the main tank. That main tank that you're looking at is cast in place concrete. It's got a capacity of 350,000 gallons and it's going to offer spectacular views of the sharks and other species in there. So again, we made a table uh, to check the overall embodied carbon uh, and GWP of the choice mix designs. And in this case, we really put an emphasis on uh, using re uh, uh, replacement cement mixes. We worked with a lot of uh, slag replacement up to 50% or more, uh, and we were able to essentially uh, reduce as much as we could out of this mix. And we found that we were able to reduce this against the NRMCA baseline 45%. Um, and again, we don't anticipate any change in the project schedule by doing this. Again, items in red, the mixes, the cubic yards, the design strength, yellow is the actual uh, GWP of those mixes. And again, in this case, we blew past our goal uh, and hit 45% reduction with zero impacts to the schedule and honestly minimal cost increase. It was about $50,000 on a $15 million concrete package that we added uh, by, by selecting these mixes. So not, not terrible. So. If you have SPO in your business unit, you know, how can you leverage them to help out? Well, first of all, both SPO group, uh, your local SPO group and your local sustainability manager are excellent resources. You should use them, ask questions, uh, engage them early on. Make sure that you bring them in early in the process uh, to look for opportunities and, and goals that we can set early on in the process, right? When you get to CD level documents, it's kind of hard to go back and change design parameters. Whereas if you're talking about these things early on, SD, concept, BD, wherever you're at, you have more opportunities to make changes to the design and make impacts that uh, will have a real benefit. Uh, turn to the GCs in on this process early a lot of times and can help steer the owner and designer in the right direction. So again, early engagement is key. It's also important that you engage your local suppliers for EPDs, lunch and learns and alternate mix designs. They're the experts, so you should ask them questions as well. Alana's got a lot of knowledge. Your ready mix producers across the country have a lot of knowledge on this stuff. And then look for insight on how you can optimize the design to hit your goals for embodied carbon reduction and maintain the cost and schedule girl, uh, goals that Turner has for the project. And then use technology to combat the early strength problem, right? There's a lot, it's true. These, these mixes do uh, change the early strength profile, but if you utilize technology like sensors, uh, you're gonna have more opportunity to continue uh, maintaining the schedule with less impact. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but as we talked about, there are concrete maturity sensors. Alana brought them up. Um, they're essentially sensors that we can cast in the concrete, measure the in-place strength. The thing I'm going to leave you guys with is that the uh, an example is we have uh, an example where we did a core wall. The actual in-place strength of that core wall after 18 hours was 4,000 psi. We had cylinders that were breaking at 1,500 psi because they were not cooking at the same temperature. And so by using sensors, we were able to know that and able to make smart decisions on what we were going to do with moving our formwork and keeping the schedule on track. If you want to know more about this, you can find it on the sustainability uh, website on TKN. Uh, we've got information about the embodied carbon uh, business case for concrete sensors, training videos, et cetera. So we won't spend time here talking about it. There's resources out there for you. Now, before we go, uh, some of you are out there saying, that's all well and good, Dave, but you know what? I don't have SPO in my business unit. And believe it or not, you can still have a tremendous impact on the embodied carbon reduction of the project, even if you're not self-performing, right? Uh, a lot of this, we were learning through doing it ourselves, but you can utilize these same strategies with your concrete subcontractors, right? So you may notice that a lot of these are very similar to self-perform, and that's because it's the same approach. It's just a little different because you're talking to your, sub or, uh, your subcontractor, your trade partner. So connect with your local subcontractors. They're the experts. Pick their brains. And again, look for opportunities and socialize the goals and strategies early. If you're talking to the subcontractors early about your goals, you can help engage them earlier on to get input and uh, provide uh, uh, opportunities for VE, opportunities for embodied carbon reduction early on. 
Same goes for the ready mix suppliers. Just because you're not a concrete contractor doesn't mean you can't engage the local suppliers. Again, schedule lunch and learns, ask them questions, they're experts. And just because you're not actually doing the concrete doesn't mean you can't go out and work with them and talk to them. Imagine that again, look for insight for VE, optimize the design, talk to your subs early, get them engaged as soon as you can and ask questions, build a relationship with those guys because they're the experts. Um, include an embodied carbon table like you saw in your bid packages. That table does not take much time to put together. Those baselines are readily available. And if you ask your or your subcontractors for these things, uh, they'll be able to provide them, right? Um, even if they won't provide them, if they're like a lot of concrete subcontractors that ignore your bid form entirely, you can still fill this out. If you ask them for mixed design numbers, you can fill out the table too. So we can still crunch the numbers even if we're having a hard time getting it out of our trade partners. With that, I'm gonna hand it back over and uh, allow time for Q&A here. Uh, appreciate your time and I'll hand it back to Emmy. Great, well, thank you so much. We've been got it, getting a lot of great questions in the chat. And uh, since we are, we only have about five minutes left, um, a lot of those questions have been answered. Um, so I'm just gonna be cherry picking a little bit um, out of the selection. Um, and one of the most recent ones uh, that just came in the chat was, are these methods cost effective? Basically, if I'm gonna reduce the embodied carbon of my concrete, does that mean I have to pay more? So I'd love to actually get each of your perspectives on cost impact um, and, and hear what you have to say on that. Um, so maybe if we could start with Alana, that'd be great. Um, the, many of them, basically they can all be done cost effectively. Um, which ones are, are the most cost effective are going to depend on the application and also depend just on what part of the country you're in and, and the ready mix producer. Not necessarily all of those are going to be achievable in all markets. And so it, it's just going to be dependent on, uh, kind of a, a project and a region basis. Um, additionally, the way they become the most cost effective is the more performance based the spec is. If there are prescriptive requirements to the spec, then sometimes those are not going to be cost effectively implemented. Great. Dirk or Dave, do you have anything to add to that? I would add that I think that, you know, usually, you know, as the engineer, we're not, we're, we're asking you for the cost information, but I think the idea that Alana mentioned of really being mindful of what strategies are appropriate to your region is is something that you all could bring forward in discussions because I've seen a few times that somebody says, I want A, and it may not make sense, but someone's enamored with A, and really if the, or A being a certain product, um, that really the idea of reducing the embodied carbon of functionally equivalent concretes is what we should keep our, our eye on. I think just to chime in on that, um, ultimately the biggest bang for the buck that we found is in the design, uh, optimizing the design, reducing the strengths, reducing the amount of concrete on a project uh, where we can are, are some of the best ways to help pull that out directly. And then the second piece of it is exactly like Alana hit on is, is uh, working on performance-based specifications. I'll give an example at the aquarium where our concrete tank, which has very high performance requirements, uh, they started with a prescriptive spec. They told us what needed to be in the concrete and that made that concrete cost about 450 bucks a cubic yard. Through talking to them about what it is they're trying to achieve, what performance they want and working with the suppliers in town, not just one, but a couple of the suppliers in town, we were able to provide a, a mixed design that didn't need the extra stuff that, was, you know, that they were forcing to put in there and surpassed the performance and brought that mix from 450 bucks a yard down to 250 bucks a yard, which again is expensive for concrete, but it's a very high performance specialty mix design. Um, so it's all about asking those probing questions, understanding what the requirement is, and then leveraging the experts to help figure out how you can solve that problem uh, you know, with, the, with the right people in the room. Great. Um, Alana did have to jump off for another meeting, so she apologized, but we do have one other question that I think we have time for. Um, one of the things that Alana had covered in her presentation was the idea of carbon fear, which yeah, I think we've all started to hear a lot about. Um, they've been doing a lot of marketing recently. Um, I wanted to get your guys' perspectives on, you know, what, you know, is carbon fear a great solution for our projects to reduce our embodied carbon? Um, and why don't we see it on all of our projects? Um, Dirk, maybe if you could start with that one, that'd be great. Sure, we, we have used Carbon Cure in our, our projects and we've seen that it can reduce um, cement content. Um, I think Blake's the one who might have 
added this in. I do think, and this is where Alana, this, Alana would be perfect for this. To the degree that Carbon Cure allows cement content to be reduced, I think it's a, a, a great use and should be considered as one of a, a layered number of strategies. Um, it's not in every market. And I think I would say the important thing is that we need to think about what can be in every market. So you don't have to like have Carbon Cure to do this. I wouldn't shy away from it, but um, I think that the, you know, it, it's, it's using CO2 as an admixture to reduce cement. And when we've done LCAs and in others I've discussed with, like when we're doing this, the whole building and looking at how all of it fits together, um, looking at that savings just as the cement savings um, in versus a, a, a sequestration, because there are some questions about like which CO2 is carbonating and what's happening with the injection. And you need to I think atomically trace it to actually follow that. So the, the, that's a very good question and some deeper discussion is warranted. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, I know that you know a lot of people might go to the ReadyMix guy and say, hey, I've heard about carbon cure, you should add it to your plant. And I think you guys just need to understand that that requires modifications to the plant itself. And so there's a lot of, you know, it's not like a snap your fingers and tomorrow you have carbon cure. It does take setup, it takes thought, and not all plants can immediately uh, uh, implement that solution. Um, so it's it's definitely worth talking about, and I agree completely with Dirk. It's one of many approaches that you can use to um, uh, solve your embodied carbon problem, uh, but it's not the be-all, end-all cure. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do in addition to that to, to really help make uh, a meaningful impact on the embodied carbon and concrete. And, and I think kind of adding on to Dave's piece, the maybe the request I would, as the designer, that if y'all were talking to concrete suppliers, like getting EPDs, because that really allows them to, you know, have a ISO standardized carbon metric. So if they use carbon cure or they get better aggregate or they use intermediate aggregate or they do something else, like we're comparing carbon to carbon, which is what we really want. And we don't want it like, just like we're saying, you don't want me to have prescriptive specs. You know, we want to get beyond like, do this, just get the mix that works with the least carbon. And then they can, everybody gets to use their skills in the way that they are most appropriate. 